All right, so very good morning. I'm beginning our recording now. So today's class will be about the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature. So being the, uh, or we call it for short, ICZN. So the ICZN solely applies for zoological specimens. If it's for botany, it's a different code altogether. And if it is for bacteria or viruses, it's a different code altogether. So the one that I'm focusing on is solely on zoology. So prior to the book being um, made and established, there were other earlier codes that were, um, they were created and established by different authors, but it catered to different specimens. Okay, so for example, like the one in 1886, um, the ornithologist, the American Ornithologist Union, uh, which is for the study of birds, did very specific study on um, just birds alone. So it didn't take into consideration other specimens. Uh, and then, of course, it becomes a little bit difficult or tricky because uh, more often not these established people have worked on specimens which are more common. But if you're saying, if you're discovering other new species, uh, invertebrates specifically, and it's, it's new species, uh, and there's no particular um, rules and regulations that we can follow that can be applied for all specimens, it becomes a little tricky. So this is where, uh, with the discovery of new species, taxonomists in particular realized that there was a dire need to do uh, to have a code that can is standardized, that can be applied for all specimens. So then, henceforth, this is where the ICZN actually came into, into play. So the ICZN, or also known as the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature, was actually uh, formed by the end of the 19th century, as it became apparent that more and more problems have been created instead of amicable as settlement. So it's not just about the discovery of new species. The problem is some species, as I've mentioned before, there are some that are very cryptic species, some that look very conspecific, some that look, hey, it's sort of familiar and whatnot. And then uh, where there were issues, where new, where specimens were um, established, say, regionally, but it has been established um, in other regions. So obviously this becomes a bigger problem having to create uh, to actually work on new species is always quite, quite easy. But when it comes to actually having to do a review work, it becomes a little bit more trickier. So this is why uh, they mentioned that there were more, uh, in, more and more problems were coming up instead of actually having to settle things uh, very straightforward. So as a result, it became essential to have the ICZN. So on the 11th of January, 1964, a draft was actually prepared and submitted to the International Congress of Zoological Nomenclature. And this Congress was formed in 1910. So it, the ICZN, the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature, was approved by the Commission and was finally accepted by voting as the International Code for Zoological Nomenclature. And the first was especially published um, by the International Trust of Zoological Nomenclature in 1961. So uh, this is actually the, the time frame of what, how the Universal Code later got adapted for specifically for animals. So again, the commission established in 1895. Uh, the first publication of the Regals came in in 1905, but the first international code came into form in 1961. And then there were adaptations um, based on new discoveries or new issues that needs to be addressed. So the second one came into place in 1964, third in 1985, fourth in 1999. And the current one that we're actually using is as of 2012. Okay, so the hard copy actually looks like this. It's a green hard copy uh, and it's adopted by the International Union of Biological Sciences. If you need to find the online version, um, uh, actually, you actually have to go to this link, uh, www.iczn.org uh, slash iczn slash index, and you'll be able to find this. So this is how it would look like. 
this is the editorial committee um, pretty much whatever you find here is exactly how you'll find it in the hard copy so it's broken into chapters different chapters uh, we will go see into what is actually inside the ICZN so if you actually were to say open up um, a chapter you'll find different articles and then within the articles you would actually find sub uh, articles or sub chapters that actually then example if it's 8.1 criteria to be met it actually talks about what are the criteria uh, what are the criteria that needs to be met so who are these people that we're talking about um, with regards to the commission so when trouble strikes uh, the commission is a sub is um, established by 26 distinguished scientists from 20 over countries uh, and they sit and they sit judgment on cases all right so um, I actually I believe now they actually knew people in the committee one of it which I actually had a personal meet from Australia which is uh, Dr. Shane Ayong he works on lobsters and other crustaceans so the thing with um, the fact that the ICZN is readily available however if there are other problems that are not readily available with the ICZN um, and it has to do with uh, concerning the name of animals that cannot be dealt by the court the, applica the applicants presents an argument or a case which is then later published in BZN or known as the Bulletin of Zoological Nomenclature so that is the process and of course it's reviewed by um, by this committee in the commissions okay so now coming into the parts of the ICZN so the ICZN is comprised of the code that we all talk about and this is the like the the hardcore aspect of the ICZN followed by appendices and the glossary so with the code it includes uh, preambles preambles is more like an introduction okay which is followed by 87 consecutive number articles which is grouped in 18 chapters so as I mentioned before uh, this is how the chapters are so there are 18 chapters altogether and within the chapters are these articles so all together there are about um, 87 articles so the articles are composed of mandatory compulsory rules to which in some cases are attached to recommendations so meaning to say that the articles actually have rules um, and it comes with recommendations on how you may use the articles and it actually gives examples so the use of recommendation is not mandatory but lays down the best procedure for cases not strictly covered by the application of the rules so meaning to say that at, by the name itself a recommendation uh, it's not mandatory so it's more of a guide for you to follow as to what to do all right and these are designated by numbers of the article which they are associated followed by the appropriate capital number so for example uh, if you're talking about article 10 so the recommendations will come in as 10 uh, recommendation a or if it's article 72 then 72 uh, recommendation B and it follows okay all right then comes the appendices so the appendices are like recommendations not to be followed strictly like article like the article um, okay so when you're talking about the article itself like how it will be written example here this is mandatory okay when in this case it doesn't have recommendation so below it if they have the word listed as recommendation um, it's best to follow as much as possible but the appendices in this case is not strict doesn't have to be strictly followed so these are five in numbers and are all designated from a to e the particular paragraph of the appendices is written as a7 d21 etc and the glossary basically are terms so if you need to find a particular term say the word holotype or you know um other type material or naming of class or family etc so you can use the keyword and then of course that's what the glossary stands for okay that's just the gist of how the iczn is structured 
Now, what are the important requirements that it caters to? Okay, so this is the part that we're coming to of the requisites or the important aspects that we need to cater for scientific nomenclature or the scientific naming process. So the scientific naming process looks into three aspects. I've covered this a little bit uh, in the first lecture, but this is the part we're coming into a bit detail. So the first part is uniqueness. So a classification is a filing system, an information retrieval system, pretty much um, equivalent to that of your identification card, basically. So if you relate it to that example, then you would understand this better. Every name has to be unique because it is the key to entire literature relating to the species or higher taxon. So in other words, technically, if you were to take a blue, uh, not, sorry, your fingerprint or your ID, it basically opens the door uh, to every aspect about you. Uh, we haven't come to the aspect of our ID being linked to things like our health status, etc. But to some degree, it does give some information about our ID in terms of our, our, our race, our religion, where do we stay, those kind of things. So if several names have been given the same taxon, there must be a clear-cut method of determining which of them has validity. So meaning to say, okay, the thing with, say, example, with our ID, there might be a high chance that uh, we actually might have a similar name. But of course, there are certain things that are obviously going to be very different. This is by coincidence, you might bump into someone with a similar name. But when it comes to the scientific nomenclature for species, uh, zo zoological species, that actually applies to even botany for that matter and, and, and bacteria and viruses. If there is at all a similar name, there must be a method of how one can uh, verify and make a name valid for at least one species or one specimen. So in the case of the zoological nomenclature, the priority usually decides in the case of conflict. So I will give a case study about this example of uniqueness. So again, if two, um, say, species just by chance happen to have a similar genus name, so that name uh, is considered a homonym. I know you've learned about synonyms, but synonyms are different names that mean the same thing. So remember how I showed you the list for last week's class? That is to show that there are different names that were called for in reference to one species. However, a homonym is in reference to one name that can be, a, that uh, not can be, but is applied for different species. So in order to reduce this, um, this mistake from happening, the principle of priority is applied, meaning to say which of the two or three species was given the name first. That is what you mean by the priority, okay? Then coming into the aspect of universality, okay? Or it's a universal name. So the scientific communication would be very difficult if they were only vernacular names for animals. What you mean by vernacular names here means it's common names or lay terms like ikan ayah, ikan sela, or ikan ayah might have different names, but it's a common name. It's not a Latin derived name. In the case, specialists would have to learn the names of taxa in innumerable languages in order to communicate each other. So what are you trying to say here that if at all we were to use different common names, uh, uh, vernacular names, if, say example, one is coming from Japan, one is coming from China, one is coming from Malaysia, and we have one particular species that we that all of these regions have this, but by chance, in terms of the, the local language, it's called differently. So what they're trying to say here is we would actually have to waste our time having to learn different languages. So to avoid this, a single set of names, which of course we know as the Latin name, for animals to be used worldwide. And then the last part is stability. It's a stable name. So as recognition symbols, the, as recognition symbols the names of objects, would lose much of their usefulness if they are changed frequently and arbitrarily. So 
what we want to ensure is, of course, we now with the modern methods of naming taxonomy, of course, we now know that we have to use it with two names in particular, unless you're talking about subspecies. But however it is, you have to look through worms, you have to look through um, to seeing whether there are other names that have been used other than what you're intending to suggest for a new species. So, and once you give a name, preferably you want the name to stick for long and there are no other species found um, or that so much so that you have to create a whole long list of synonyms, okay? So that's what you mean by the stability. So you don't want to have to change frequently over time. Once you stick to the name, uh, preferably it's a name that we can use for a very long time. It would certainly create confusion if you were to talk to call an object a spoon today but an apple the next week. Very simply put, basically. So this is what we need to ensure that the ICZN does. So what the ICZN can't particularly monitor is make taxonomic decisions. So what do you mean by make taxonomic decision is that you as the expert are better at understanding the specimen you're dealing with in terms of its biology, in terms of why um, the description needs to be so, etc. So it, it can only give a general guideline, okay? It's like basically following an SOP that can be generalized and applied for all. However, other certain aspects with regards to your species alone only you would know best. And of course, give names to organisms. You are in the best position to give a name to the organism. It can only give a general statement like preferably do not name the species after you, although you may have been the author. So, uh, but other things that it can apply, of course, you can, you can be inspired to use uh, the name like what I've given you in my first class. So those kind of things. Enforce correct use of the names. Ha, this is the other thing. So enforce the correct use of the names in terms of the grammatical aspect, whether or not it follows like a feminine aspect or a masculine aspect, because it's a, these are things that when it comes to Latin names, it, it looks into these kind of things, all right? And then the change of names. We make decisions between existing alternatives. So changing of names meaning to say that, uh, remember I mentioned about the synonym list, it's because when you have studied the species and then you realize, hey, somebody else discovered this, and they, there is no choice but a need to actually combine the names uh, or combine the species so in order to uh, reduce the tendency of um, changing names over time when you're doing a review like that. So in this case, we don't, of course, we don't encourage, but um, of course, you are in the best position to know that, hey, this species actually is similar or it's not similar and there's a need to pull it out. So those are the things that you are in the best position to know if you are the expert of your field. So when I was talking about recommendations, okay, so this is an example of what I was talking about. So the chapter 7 was talking about formation and treatment of names. So this is what the article says about um, this aspect, where a scientific name must be formed and treated in accordance with the relevant provisions of Article 11 and Article 26 to 34. So meaning to say you actually have to refer back to 11 and 26. But what it mentions for, for the recommendation, so the first recommendation comes as 20, again, in reference to the first, this article 25. So it comes as 25A. So in regards to abbreviation, uh, so it explains about what the abbreviation is about. And then it gives an example immediately after. And then 25B talks about derivation, okay? It's publishing a new scientific name and author should state it's their vision, meaning to say the, the etymology aspect, okay? So this one probably is very straightforward and doesn't require an example. And then you have like recommendation 25C. So that is how the recommendations are in relation to 20, uh, the article 25, okay? All right. Now we're coming to the code. As I mentioned, the code is the one that constitutes like what, 95% of the whole book. The appendices and glossary is, is just sort of secondary. What is really important is the whole code. All of this part comes under the code. So the code is composed of criteria and principles, code of ethics and general recommendations. So how this is pretty much the flow of the, uh, 
content of the ICZN. So I will briefly run through the criteria part, followed by the, then I will jump to code, ethic, code of ethics and general recommendation because the principles is going to take a bit of time from me, okay? So the first part, we'll go into the criteria of publication. So this is where uh, the criteria needs to be, back, uh, to be made, sorry, where a work must satisf satisfy the following criteria. It must be issued for the purpose of providing a public permanent scientific record. So whatever new species that you have discovered, say if you found your work in Pulau Bidong or etc. and you find it to be a new species, just writing your report alone or doing a final year project is not enough. It has to be a scientific record, preferably in a scientific journal, that is made for the purpose of providing public and permanent scientific record. So once it's made public, it's global and everybody is aware of it. It must be obtainable. There you go. When first issued, free of charge or by purchase. And it must have uh, produced in an edition containing simultaneously obtainable copies by a method that assures identical and durable copies. So one can make uh, durable copies of it. Publication must be disclaimed. A work that contains a statement to the effect that it's not issues, that is not issued for public or permanent scientific record or for the purpose of zoological nomenclature is not published within the meaning of the code and names and acts may be disclaimed. If a work or a statement to the effect that all or any of the names or nomenclature acts are disclaimed uh, for nomenclature purposes, the disclaims names or acts are not available. Such works may be published, worked, may have the same nomenclatural status as the taxonomic information in a published but suppressed work. So what I mean by all this dis disclamation is that um, if certain works do not partic although published or sometimes it does not meet the certain requirements uh, that was overlooked, it can be this case, it can be overlooked. I mean sorry, not can be overlooked, it can be dismissed. Ha, huh. and then works produced before 1986, uh, it needs to be published. A work produced before 1986 must have been produced on a paper. Because back uh, before 1986, a lot of it was manual. Not a lot of them was really, really available online. So whatever it is, before 1986, it has to be have produced by paper, printed method, uh, then conventional, such as letterpress or offset printing or by hectograph or mimeograph. So these, again, are the requirements that need to be met when it comes to publications. Uh, uh, so this is what I've covered, public and permanent, obtainable, and has to have many copies. So there was a recommendation by the ICZN that from the last works of the other works in 2012, that there needs to be an amendment for the ICZN, as of course they found other new issues. So some of the things that they've um, highlighted is that is that it needs to be. Let me just highlight this and make it bigger. So that electronic only publication should be allowed. So now they are they are even considering about removing hard copies. Hard copies. If mechanisms can be found that give reasonable assurance of long-term accessibility or information. As long as the publication is such that is, you are able to access it and is readily available, those are the ones that you really want to take into consideration. Some method of registration should be part of the mechanism allowing electronic publication of names and nomenclatural acts and physical works that are not paper-based should be disallowed like CD-ROMs and DVDs. So even CD-ROMs and DVDs are something that needs to be omitted. So again, which is why that Biodiversity Heritage Library is so highly important because there are so many uh, university-based libraries that have such important records and they have been being, I mean, uh, we really ought to owe it to these librarians into making those work accessible for us. Can you imagine works of the 1800s and 1700s and you don't need to go waste it. So... They're, they're really actually putting effort into making all of these resources available. So now coming to the criteria of availability, meaning that 
we can easily obtain the uh, the work, the paper or the specimen in that sense. Okay, so to be available a name or where relevant, a nomenclature act must certify the following provisions. So one, of course, you need to be able to get hold of the publication. Uh, mandatory use of Latin. So again, it cannot be vernacular, meaning to say it can't be of your local language. You can put it as of what it's known, but the species has to be recognized as a Latin uh, base name. And the derivation is providing it meets requirements. A name may be a word in or derivation from Greek, Latin, or any other language, or to be formed from such a word, it may be arbitrary combination of letters providing this can be used as a word. Okay, meaning to say example, um, for, for example like this, Tokso, Tokostoma and Brachyrhynchos from the Greek word, a possum for, so meaning to say, you, these words are technically uh, locally based use terms, okay, a possum is um, actually Algonquian Indian, Abu Def is probably Arabic based, but it's actually, they've made it, they've Latinized it in order to uh, make it um, Latin based, um, a Latin based nomenclatural name. Okay, so Changuru. So basically, you have all these different names, but what you're doing is that you make it, you Latinize the names. So that's what they mean. You Again, you cannot make it into a vernacular name like ikan ayah. You can't say it like that. If you want to use ayah, ikan ayah, like just the word ayah, but you want to Latinize the name, you just have to make it like ayai or ayam or something like that. that. Then that can be acceptable. So there are so many other articles regarding to the availability. But again, um, I won't go into all of this. It's up to you how you want to look into it, especially if you're interested in, well, creating new species or etc so that's the very simple aspects of criteria so now we're moving into code of ethics and general recommendations so when it comes to code of ethics um, the first thing is no author should propose a name to or his or her knowledge or reasonable belief would be likely to give offense on any grounds so when it comes to ethics in other words when you're giving a name, it should not insult anybody or should not come in as offensive to anyone. But this is always usually arbitrary in a sense that sometimes it sounds like you're giving a recognition for someone, but maybe you want to offend somebody. I'll give you an example here later of what I'm talking about. The second part of the Code of Ethics is intemperate language should not be used in any discussion which involves zoological nomenclature and all debates should be conducted in a courteous and friendly manner. So you cannot use any particular rude language um, to offend anybody. It has to be very nice and courteous. So very straightforward to the Code of Ethics. When it's coming to the general recommendation, new names should be in Latin form. Again, very straightforward. They should be euphonious and easily memorable. Basically, of very straightforward lah. it has to be something that is easy to remember meaning to say it's the name of the place the name of the host etc that's one way of making it um, really available okay so what I was talking about in terms of the code of ethics Carl Linnaeus had pretty much some good examples of um, finding ways of being offend may have been offensive and also quite um, quite in some ways not say vulgar but in a way inappropriate in some in some ways so being the father of taxonomy uh, he was of course is the founder of the binomial nomenclature binomial meaning two names the genus and the species so although he worked uh, heaps he worked heaps on both zoological and uh, botany botany specimens he was primarily a botanist so the thing is because he founded the whole idea of and gave namings of stuff, um, he, did he really set some bad examples for some the next generation of biologists? So these are things that we question. And of course, um, 
whether or not he apprised the principle of orderliness. Okay, so let me give you an example of one thing that he named. Phallus Impudicus, Linnaeus in 1753. Oh, God. <laughs> okay, so you immediately caught the meaning. As for the rest of you, what does that mean? What does Phallus mean? What does Impudicus mean? I really like your opinion. I, what, what, well, the, the picture itself is very straightforward. But yeah, what is it? Anybody? Come on. Hello. <laughs> Male thingy. Very good. Yes. Correct. And then the impudicus is to show that it's not shame. Shameless. Okay. Shameless genitalia. Okay. So that the thing is, technically, it looks exactly like this. And it's actually quite memorable, isn't it? I mean, it's very straightforward. How can you sort of forget it? However, in terms of the code of ethics, is it considered rude? So, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a very sort of... Um, I mean, if you want looks, one looks into genitalia, I mean... Well, there needs to be a name for something anyway, isn't it? So, to what context are you going to be like taking it out of context? Okay, that's one. And then he named this, Clitoria Tonator. <laughs> okay, good. You, one seems to have the idea. How about the rest? Alamak, sorry, yeah, I know this is Ramadan season. So, <laughs> but again, otak clear. We are otak masih... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, again, taking a good aspect, but the flower is, is called like that. But the thing is, it's Linnaeus who called it like that. So, I mean, he probably could have given a different name. But yes, um, so what I'm trying to get at is, you know, should it, I mean, the fact that it really does resemble a clitoria. But that's what I'm saying. Is it technically offensive to some people? Is it rude? So pretty much I leave that up to you, you know? What do you want? But of course, it's very easily, I mean, if one were to make clitoria, it's like, ah, okay, very straightforward. You can remember this easily. So it's, yeah, it's pretty much, yeah, that, that's this thing that I'm talking about. Linnaeus actually brought a lot about, brought a lot of debate into this kind of conversations. Okay, so back to, again, the code of ethics, right? Uh, coming to the part of retaliation, of about the code of ethics saying that, that one cannot offend any people. It cannot be rude. cannot, yeah. So there's one part where, okay, John Johann Sigurds Beck, I hope I didn't butcher his name, he published a diatribe criticizing Linnaeus, okay? So Linnaeus, I think, went about describing this particular species, but... Johan actually um, criticized his work. So then later on, jo uh, Linnaeus decided to choose a small weedy flower and decided to uh, name this after Sigurds Bechia. Okay? So now, obviously from the, the idea that it's coming from a weed, so obviously he might it might symbolize him sort of being a weed and name it after him. However, if you were to look at it in another aspect, Linnaeus could probably put about it as, you know, he probably appreciates the work of Johan and and just by chance he found a weed and decided to recognize him after a weed. So, so is this considered a retaliation or is it a recognition? So it's a very fine line of, of things. It's always very tricky to say. As much as the Code of Ethics says very strictly, you cannot do so, but where's the fine line? And it depends on how a person debates about this. Alright, so then another aspect, is it an offensive name? Okay, so um, there was a beetle, a blind cave dwelling beetle that was named after Hitler that was, uh, and given the name Enoch Thalmus Hitleri. Okay, 
So, but the thing with this is, um, again, Hitler to some might, to be honest, a lo I think predominantly might be taken as, um, yeah, as a, you know, a horrific person in history, but some actually, <laughs> but some actually were to idolize him in a lot of ways. So now the followers of Hitler are hunting them so vigorously as mementos that the species is likely to become extinct. So to you, it may be an offensive name, but for some, just by giving that name, it forms such a craze, so much so that collecting the species is actually driving it to extinction. So Martin Barr, an entomologist at the Zoological uh, state collection in Munich said that there has been a run of these species, meaning to say that people have really been looking out for the species and collectors are scarring their natural habitat for them. So again, it's not only collecting the species, you're the prob probably in the midst of destroying the, uh, the habitat. And of course, destroying the habitat destroys other species that coexist with them. So almost all of our specimens at the museum have been stolen. So I have no idea why the craze of actually having to find this whether whether or not is it really for the craze of collecting the beetle or there are many people who find naming the species offensive so much so they are collecting it to sort of revive Hitler. You know, there's so many things that can be looked into upon. But this is why certain things become so delicate, so much so that it might seem very um, harmless in nature but it can be offensive to some, and to some degree, of course, this is what has happened. Then another aspect that I'd like to ask you guys, the fact that we have pretty much, we must have a name-bearing type for every form of species. What about Homo sapiens? Is there really a need to have a holotype for Homo sapiens? Do we even have a holotype for Homo sapiens? Can I see something on the chat or some anybody wants to say anything? Do we have? Okay, not sure. Others? Pair up man, but is pair up man sort of a global thing? Ah, that, very, very interesting, Zul, that you mentioned Fir'auns or Pharaohs. Um, it's plentiful of them, but interestingly, nobody has quite made a, a, a holotype for mummy. The fact that there's so many out there, actually one could actually easily make, right? Um, there was also another debate that since we sort of originated um, from Africa, so it was sort of best to have an African representation. But uh, it wasn't really fully uh, established of having that as a holotype. And of course, it's considered quite um, offensive, again, in some ways, because um, the, th the thing with human nature is that we have a kind of subconscious thing of having respect for the dead also. So to have a, a such a display for people to see of a dead is actually quite rude and offensive. So... Uh, people have really uh, sort of omitted this whole aspect, holotype of having a homo sapien. So technically, we are all walking um, holotypes in some ways, if you want to put it. So, there, But there's no particular holotype for homo sapiens, the fact that we are very common so it's and they're very diverse. So there's no particular holotype actually for homo sapiens. But thank you for your feedback. I, I really like this. Some, some interesting feedback.